He's Howard Eibach, a former copywriter and creative director and the author of two books on the creative brief. And he's Henry Gomez, an ad agency strategist with over 26 years of experience. Together, we're the Brief Brothers. We, have, we love to talk about creative briefs, briefing and advertising. We're back, Henry. Today, we have a guest all the way from London. London seems to be a favorite venue for us. And he is, I guess now we can say, a former account planner. But his current title is CMO for an energy startup named Bulb in London. His name is Russell Davies. And he is someone I was introduced to a very long time ago. Let's take a listen to the conversation. So Henry, we're back with another episode and I am delighted to say that Russell Davies has joined us from London. Uh, Russell, without knowing it, is, is a bit of a mentor of mine. When I first started exploring creative briefs, and briefing way back in the middle of the two, 2000s, you know, 2005, 2006, 2007, uh, Lance Saunders, who was a guest on our show last year, told me as I was his acolyte, he was my first mentor, said, you need to read uh, John Steele and you need to read Russell Davies. And I found his blog posts and he was the one who really got me starting to think about the brief from the perspective of a planner. So although he just told us that he's no longer working as a planner today, I want to have him give us a little background. I am really happy to say that Russell Davies is, has joined us. So Russell, welcome to the Brief Brothers. Hello, glad to be here. Could you, could you do us a little favor and tell us a little bit about your background and, and your, your connection to the advertising business and Maybe you can start off by telling us what the creative brief has meant to you over the years. How has your thinking about it evolved? Um, can I come back to that last bit? Sure. I'll, so I've been working in advertising, um, for, as we were saying, for several hundred years now. Um, I, um, I first started, I probably started in advertising in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, I had a, a very average career as an account manager, uh, account, account person, had a relatively average career as an account planner. I got into, I got, I became very interested in the internet very early for an advertising person. Um, and in around 93, got myself a job with a, with, cause we called it interactive then. Uh, I, I got I got myself a job as an in, as head of interactive at um, Leo Burnett in London, mm. and um, I managed to get a job at Leo Burnett, and they managed to hire me uh, without anyone mentioning that their biggest client was Philip Morris, um, and uh, it was before the internet; it was not a thing you could Google. So I got there. And they said, yeah, the only people who are interested in this at all are the people who sell cigarettes. Uh, and I was like, I don't want to do that. Um, so I spent a year trying to leave Philip Morris, uh, trying to leave Leo Burnett. And um, that process led me to uh, back to planning. And I was hired as a planner at uh, Widening Kennedy in Portland, Oregon. Um, because I was Good one job. of... Yeah. Well, and it was because they'd just won the Microsoft business and I was one of three planners in the world who knew how to turn a computer on. Um, so I <laughs> got a job. Uh, so I went there and basically spent 10 years at Wyden in Portland and then London, um, which is has informed basically how I think about planning and strategy and communications and stuff. Uh, and I, it was a very fortunate environment for me to learn my trade um and spoiled me for all other jobs um bad. so uh so yeah so i came back from there in early 2000s went to work for nike for a little while as a result of working at widen went freelance worked for a lot of other agencies wasn't really successful at any of those um uh then went to work for the government um, there was a thing called the Government Digital Service in the UK where, where we had a mission, this would have been around 2012, to um, reinvent how government communicated to citizens 
uh, online. Um, did that for a few years, then had more unsuccessful attempts to do advertising, um, and then ended up uh, in a marketing role for a startup renewable energy company uh, called Bulb. Um, so I became CMO uh, there. Um, and that's where I still am. Um, so like I say, it's been a long time since I've probably actually written a creative brief. Uh, and um, I, to back to the question of my relationship to creative briefs, when they come up, I'm always, I'm always, I've always forgotten that that's the thing that we obsess about. Um, and um, I, I would, I honestly don't think I've ever written a good creative brief. I've been involved in lots of good creative work, but it was never because of the brief. Um, and or if I have written a good creative brief, it's probably never turned into good work. Um, well, so. you're just inspiring me now, Russell, to track down some of your colleagues and creative colleagues to to confirm what I think is. Uh, an admirable streak of modesty, um, uh, which just makes me, like I said, admire you even more. Because Hen <laughs> Henry, well, Henry talks a lot about the fact that planners have to be humble. Because when you work with creatives, and I'm a creative, see, that's what brought Henry and I together. Henry's a, a planner, and I'm a creative, a former creative. And we have this passion for this thing called the brief, the briefing process, but we see it from different perspectives. And he learns from creatives when he collaborates with them and they learn from him from the way he, he sees the world. But he, he, and he says this over and over again, he'll, he'll, he'll tell you himself, you've got to be humble about this process because it's not like he's writing an edict, right? It's not like he's carving this in stone. It's not the 10 commandments. It's, oh, a, start, it's a starting I see, point. I see the creative brief and that stage of an assignment is a great place to fuck things up if you if you so i i i think that it's a a good reminder to all people who are brief writers that yeah you want to write an inspiring creative brief but at minimum you don't want to lead people down the wrong path or you know create more work or 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 you know so um that's kind of I think Howard summed it up I I like to believe that that a good strategist a good planner is somebody who is humble open to other views and brings that in and it's useful to the creatives it's uh, we're not the stars of the show yeah I I I build on that but I mean definitely when I've talked to people about briefs I think like a good brief prevents bad work uh, it also prevents brilliant work. Um, it it um, it creates, for the most part, it creates work that's not that's not terrible. Um, but it it doesn't enable work that's uh, that's remarkable. Um, and, I, and again, I want to I want to push back you, on that. What, what, what do you mean? It, it I I get that it, it you know Henry has said that a brilliant creative brief doesn't guarantee brilliant creative but it vastly improves the odds. I think that's what Henry says. So the first part of your, 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 your argument I, I buy, that it, it, it helps improve the work, but you're saying now that it, it prevents brilliant work. What do you mean by that? Well, because the... the, the... Well, I, I think we fir first of all, you have to go, the actual form you fill in, you know, like the written creative brief thing is, I don't know, 5% of the briefing process. Um, and uh, it's mostly there for administrative reasons, bureaucratic reasons. You know, it's mostly there because people won't start work until the form's filled in, the, cl the client has to approve something. You know, it's it's like there needs to be a job number. Um, the, the, it, it sort of does that. And for the most part, and I think in the, it's, it's like an instruction to start work. It's like now do work. Um, but I know with people I've talked to, it's like if you're a planner and you have a brilliant idea, for God's sake, don't put it in the brief because that's a guarantee it won't show up in the work. Um, <laughs> it's and because you if the thing um, to your point about being humble, the thing you learn as a planner is if you want your ideas in the work, you have to take your name off them. 
um, the, the creatives have to have the credit. Um, so if you write it on the brief, they're like, that is a great idea, but we can't use that because we didn't think of it. Um, so you either have to like hide it somehow in there or the thing we did at Wyden in London all the time was just put it on the kettle. Like we'd put it near the tea pot, you know, so that the creators felt, thought they'd found it. They're like, ah, oh, we, you know, we're struggling with this brief, but we came across this thing, you know, that we could use in the work. You're like, oh, did you? Great. Well done. You know. So I, I was thinking of, of the, you know, the trail of breadcrumbs, uh, you know, analogy. And I, and I think, and I agree. I think your observation is one that is, has to do with the actual nature of the creative mind and, and how, you know, the practical way in which creatives work. And that is, they want to be the authors of, of the work and they don't want to feel that, that they were um, somehow executing someone else's idea. Um, but I do think that the strategist, because and Howard and I talk about this a lot, the planner um, is the person tasked with taking these gobs of information, most of it irrelevant, um, and reducing it down to like, what is really important here with this assignment? Like, what is the, the real problem? What is the problem that communications can help to solve? Because there might be other problems that communications can't solve, right? Um, so uh, I, I do think you are being a little bit modest about what a strategist can do in terms of at least orienting the, the person in the right direction. If you ever play pin the tail on the donkey, right? You know, the you put the blindfold on, you spin the person around, make them real dizzy. But at some point you push them toward the thing on the wall that's the donkey right and and so i i think that that's kind of the role of the strategist to make sure that they don't walk in exactly the wrong direction um but based on you know experience and another thing that i i have said on this podcast is for young planners and strategists not to believe that they know everything as brilliant as they might be a lot of this has nothing to do with your inherent brilliance, but just how long you've been around and how many things you've seen and, and, and how much experience you have and how many clients you've worked with and how many scenarios and how many categories. And it all starts to build up to a point where you have like a critical mass of knowledge where you quickly recognize patterns, which by the way is important. Like if you're in a pitch to quickly recognize this is bullshit. This is important. Let's get let's get to the heart of the matter and let's get to your point. Let's get the creatives working on the assignment. It is the start of the of the assignment, but hopefully more than just, you know, firing the starters gun, giving them something to some fuel to at least get them going. Yeah. And again, I think a lot of this is um I'd forgot. I, again, I, I think advertising particularly has a tendency to, to think it's a, there's a singular process. And having worked in lots of places, the way advertising is created at a place like Wyden and Kennedy is, is not just a different version of how advertising is created at a place like Ogilvy. It's, it's not just we do it, you know, we, we basically do the same thing, but in a different way. It, it, like they do a very different thing. Um, and as, so I worked, um, when was this early two thousands? Um, we created a campaign for Nike called run London. Um, and looking it, it, this was the first time really where people had taken advertising money and spent it on an event. So we were given the brief was do, do advertising for running shoes. Uh, and we said, why don't we organize a 10K instead? So with that money, which I mean, now seems incredibly banal, like a really obvious idea. But but then like no one had thought of it. And they were like, what? how are we going to do that? How do you organize a 10K? Uh, so, but, but it became a big thing. And um, loads of brands then, oh, we want to do that. So we got people flocking in to go, we've got some advertising money. We want to spend it on an event. 
and we uh, we were asked to work on God was it it's Purcell I think in the UK it's a different brand in the US um, but their line is one of the best advertising lines ever which has never been executed well against which is dirt is good um, and uh, they said we, we've got this line dirt is good we've got a brand we want to do an activation event um, and uh, we were like okay great so I, I sat down with the client and said okay tell me all about it and they they told me about it and I said that sounds great let's go and get the creatives and get started and they were they were like what but we need to, surely we we work very deeply with Lowe's and uh, a long time with someone else that like Unilever uh, sort of uh, house agencies that they make it very clear that we've got a very we've got to get a very tight creative brief written and agreed first um, and signed off by everyone before we involve the creatives otherwise we're wasting creative time and I like had a sudden realization it's like oh no we're, we're widening Kennedy that's what we do we waste creative time um, because that's because that's how you get brilliance like and and you've got to remember that advertising planning when it was invented in the 60s 70s and particularly when it came to prominence in the 80s was an exercise in reducing amount of money you spend on creatives so the planner's job was like so there's one planner and they could as 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 henry said they do all the work that henry said that the creatives used to do so the creative used to read all the stuff and find out and and in doing that they'd find nuggets of brilliance and things they could use so now we go well there's two of them it's that's more expensive why don't we get a single planner to do all that work do the strategic stuff write the brief and then the credit so the creativity like the expensive resource is a concentrated burst of activity and then you know the planner will take over and do the pre-testing and blah 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 it's like an economic decision um yeah. whereas again the places i've worked where the where their um the the thing they sell is utterly remarkable creative they they go like no we we, it, we are really expensive because all the people are thinking all the time um hmm. and that uh, that so a brief a brief in that situation is more of a kind of writing up that actually actually this is true i hadn't thought about this but in those sort of scenarios i don't think you ever have a fixed brief you have like a brief that's go let's get started then after a week ago oh we think the brief is here now and then the brief becomes an agreement about what we were going to do and then a sort of a further distillation of having explored all this stuff now we think this should be the brief um very well, it changed all it changed through the making of the work so uh, the one thing that i would challenge in a friendly way is <laughs> I, that I, I i agree with you that um perhaps for some this was seen as a strictly economic play but i also I, I so my background is I have an economics degree from the University of Florida. I ended up in advertising on a lark. Um, I two, I began working basically as the office errand boy, um, picking up the boss's dry cleaning and and you know making photocopies and stuff. I worked in account service. I worked in production. I anytime there was a vacancy in the small agency, I they would plug me in because somehow they thought I could do it. And I, and I did. And when I reached a certain point of, of seniority in the agency, what I realized was that there wasn't a lot of rhyme or reason to the things that we were doing and the things that the clients were asking. There was nobody asking why. And so and the reason was because there was no strategy department. There was, you know, and so what I, what I would say is, in cases like, and I, I'm fortunate enough right now to to work with colleagues at Widen and Kennedy New York on major piece of business that we have in common. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that creatives of that caliber who are both extremely creative and ex 
but also extremely perceptive from the business side, from the marketing side. You know, people like Bill Bernbach was a great creative, but he was a businessman. He he understood. And those people are extremely rare. I've worked with a couple of guys that, you know, immediately understood the business the client was in or, you know, were able to be perceptive enough to understand it very quickly. And I would say that in the vast majority of agencies, you just don't have that caliber of person who's both right and left brain. Um, and so um, by having one, by identifying one person that could do that and help, you know, the, the creatives, I think in, in some agency situations is very beneficial. But I agree. I mean, I think, a, a, you know, a shop like Wyden and Kennedy, I mean, it goes without saying, and it, I'm sure that at some point Wyden and Kennedy was just a, uh, an ad agency, but it became at some point a magnet for the best creative minds. And, and so you need a little bit of lightning in a bottle to get that first big break and start figuring out, oh, this is how you do this. And then you start attracting like-minded people and you build a culture and then some people wash out and, 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 some people become an integral part of that culture. And I think it's fair to say that Wyden and Kennedy has influenced a lot of the, the, the top creative shops around the world. Um, but I would just say that I, I think it's also a function of necessity because the Bill Birnbox of the world are few and far between. You know, the Lee Clouds of the world are, are, are few and far between. So Yeah, but it's also a self-fulfilling prophecy. It, it, it is like if you if you if you go, OK, we're they're different and special. We can't do things like that. We're going to do things like that. You'll never do different and special. It's uh, when I when I left Nike, I was asked by Unilever to go and do a talk. Um, it was in the UK and they said, can you come and talk to us about Basically, they, they, they basically they want that what they wanted to know is how do we do advertising as good as Nike? They were like, can you come and do a talk about that? And I said, I can tell you, I can do it in one slide, but you won't do it. Um, so that will just annoy you. So that will just be an annoying meeting, you know. Um, and uh, they said, oh no, go on. I was like, no, it will just you know it will be just frustrating for everyone. And they said, oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. I said, all right, well, I'll do it. We'll agree that you won't you won't do that. And then I'll do like tips and tricks about how to make your briefs better or whatever. Um, and I went and presented it and I said, it's like it's the the secret to make it, uh, to making effective advertising. Great, remarkable, effective advertising is to stop pretesting and wait for 20 years. Um, and that that's the and they were like, yeah, you're right. We won't do that. Um, but that's um, that's how you get a great culture by by trying to by by doing by doing that. Like Nike is was I mean, I don't know from now anymore, but as a client and when I worked there, they had a culture that supported and looked for brilliant ideas and didn't require any external validation or any methodology or any pretesting or whatever it was to find those brilliant ideas. And actually, if you weren't delivering brilliant ideas on a regular basis, you didn't get promoted. Um, and that that was just a culture that was a organizational culture, not a set of policies or procedures or whatever. And you can do that, but it takes a long time. Well, so what, you're, I... what you're saying, what you're saying, Russell, I think are two things. One, you got to trust the process of creativity, the ultimate process of creativity, which is it's it's the, you know, finding that that lightning in a bottle, which only happens when you put a couple of minds together and they do what they do. You know, James Webb, James Webb Young in his book, A Technique for Producing Ideas, explained it, the five steps. And I think you've yeah. written about that. Yeah. And you, you you can know what those five steps are, but until you do them and know where you are in them and letting that process work out, you, you can't, it's, it's like, you can't, you, it's, you can't reduce it to a formula, but that is as close to the formula as you get. The other thing is clients or brands like, like Nike or Apple and a handful of others are really unfair case studies to try to follow because they are the exceptions to the rule. And one of the reasons that we know this is that, you know, Nike 
Nike hasn't changed its tagline in 40 years. Yeah, they have. Look Loads of times. I, w I worked on, um, I, I, perennially, we would, have, we would have discussions about whether it was time to bring back Just Do It. Well, Just Do It never left. Yeah, and, it did. You know, and, and the customer's mind, it didn't. No, no, absolutely. But we killed it regularly. I, I think if you went out on the streets and said, what's the Nike tagline, everybody would say, just do it. Yeah, I mean, that, that, like I say, that's one of the advantages of being Nike is no one remembers the bad work. Yeah. I mean, look um, at how many times have American Express or UPS or other brands, you know, every time there's a new, forgive me, CMO, <laughs> uh, there's a new tagline. But yeah. Nike and, and Apple is the same way. I don't know if I, Apple even has a tagline these days, but everybody knows that the quality of the work that comes out of Apple is the equivalent of the quality of the work of the product itself. So but, maybe those are just not fair, you know, case studies to, to, to use as examples. They might, that, that might be true. And I, one of the reasons I stopped doing talks a lot was that I was always talking about Nike and Honda and Apple and stuff like that. And it just seemed like if I remember doing a thing in Reykjavik, I think, and talking about like, you know, this, this is how this happened and blah, blah, blah. And it just seems unfair because they're like, well, look, I run a carpet brand in Reykjavik. I can't do that. Um, but so, I actually think that's, I, I, I don't, there, it's like the, the guy who ran the Obama campaign talked about the way they, they transformed the digital operation for, for Obama's first election campaign. They sort of did digital properly for the first time. And he was yeah. asked how they did that. And he said, um, it's not complicated, it's just hard. And um, I, I, I think a lot of these things are that. It, it's not. Like I say, it's not complicated to be good at creativity. It's just really hard. Yeah. And so, lots of brands could do it. You just have to decide to do it. Yeah. So I, I think we're probably more in agreement than it looks um, or than oh, it might sound. in agreement. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, I have actually a, a, a speech I've given a couple of times, 10 pontifications of an ad agency veteran that I give like to students. And w one of the pontifications actually is, uh, it's number two, is most brands are not and will never be like Nike or Apple. Um, and that's a, a cold observation based just on the nature of organizations and human nature, right? We have these large corporations that breathe a um, sense of conservatism, right? Um, I, I had a post that I did on LinkedIn, a very short like almost tweet like post that I placed on LinkedIn that said um, the average agency person wants to win a lion at can the average client wants to send his kid to college. And those are two very different goals um, for two entities that have to work together on this assignment, which is the advertising of this brand. Um, and so um, you know, I think that, frankly, there's a bell curve, and I, I talk about this a lot, just kind of in society, and I think a lot of people want to be blind to it, like, you know, we have, in the United States, we have repeatedly problems with police brutality, and there's two sides of the issue, there's the law and order side that always falls on the side of the police, and they want to, you know, defend the police, and they risk their lives, and they're heroes, and then there's the the people that say the cops are always in the wrong and they're just horrible people. And and I like to say, you know what? It's just like any other profession. Some of them are outstanding at their jobs and some of them shouldn't be carrying a gun and a badge because they're dangerous and they're bad people. And most of them fall within an acceptable parameter. And I think what we see in advertising and marketing is a very steep bell curve. You know, we have some very visible um examples of marketers that have taken risks and those risks have paid off and that has created a culture within those brands to continue taking risks because the benefits are there for them but the vast majority of corporations are you know led by these faceless executives armies of faceless executives agencies and we could go on for hours agencies you know, back in the golden age of advertising in the 50s and 60s, you know, a lot of corporations were still privately held 
institutions that were led by per big personalities, you know, the anheuser Bushes of the world, the Fords of the world. When you're talking about publicly held corporations, suddenly it becomes a consensus thing. It's not about the, and agencies have become these vendors. We report into mid-level managers. We don't report in directly to the CEO of the company and can share with them, this is what your brand could be if you took a risk. Um, and so, you know, it's a complex thing. And unfortunately, you know, we're an industry that has this golden history um, of a time in which all the variables were very, very different. The economic variables were very different. Um, you know, the personnel variables were were very different. And so that's why I believe, you know, our agency is always decrying the death of our industry. You know, we're fascinated with things were always better back then. And in a way they were. I think the, the question is, how do you get the most out of clients in this current environment, in this understanding that there's all these obstacles that maybe didn't exist before, maybe they did. I just think that that bell curve has gotten steeper in terms of, you know, there's not a ton of bad, really bad, and there's not a ton of great. There's just a lot of, you know, fair to middling work out there and, you know, yeah, I mean, and that's that's why I that's why I did a terrible. I was for for a period I was uh, European. What was I? European strategy director, something for Ogilvy, and I did a terrible job because they didn't want what I sold, um, which was the chance of doing really good work, um, and. and I agree with you. If the if the goal is, uh, if the goal is like decent work, client buys it, um, you know, it won't be terrible. It'll test well. Then you need a really clear, coherent, creative brief expressed as a single-minded proposition, um, and you know, you stand a decent chance of doing that. If the goal is stuff no one in, ever seen before in the world. That's not how you do it, um, and uh, that that I just I think you sh you should at least try for that. So an an another thing that that comes to mind is, you know, you pitch a new piece of business, right? You're in a one of these beauty pageant reviews with ten agencies. They whittle it down to three. You present all your work, you win the business, and then you sign a scope of work and you start to work on it. And never at any point is there a conversation between the head of the agency and the CEO or even the CMO of the brand to have a heart to heart on what the role of creativity is going to be for this brand, which to me is very odd considering that's what you just hired us for. We, You never told us like, well, our philosophy is we want to do things nobody else has ever done before. And then the agency say, okay, that's what, you know, it, everything is unspoken. And it's almost like everybody assumes the other side wants what you want. And I think that that's the most dangerous assumption there is. And that's why I say, you know, if my client that I'm presenting daily to all he cares about is keeping his head below the lip of the foxhole so it doesn't get blown off. And I want to do work that changes the world. We're never going to meet. And that yeah. relationship isn't going to be very productive. It's going to be stressful and it's going to be very disappointing to everybody, not just the agency, but also the, the client. And I, I think for a communications business, we do very, little communicating with clients about like really what are your hopes dreams and aspirations for this brand you know um well and and similarly like one of the again one of the things i mean one of the things you you're discovering and uh, and people discover is i'm really annoying and um one of the one of the things i do um i i like to do in meetings or like to do at the beginning of projects is firstly is ban the word brand um because Everyone means something different when they say it. And so we always have to, back to, uh, uh, we were talking earlier about the, that Mitchell and Webb um, sketch. 
about ambiguous terms. Like brand is the ultimate ambiguous term. You're like, do you mean logo, company, tone of voice, name? Like, what do you mean? Um, so we do that. And then the other thing I always do on advertising projects is at the beginning of the advertising project is go around the room and say to everyone, how do you think advertising works? Um, because uh, no one really has a, no one has a very coherent theory in their head uh, about how it works. Not one that they can express for the most part. And when they do say it, they say something like, uh, well, you know, you get like a really succinct sort of message and then you boil it down to something and then you just, and then you make people aware of it. Um, and, and you're like, okay, uh, that's not what we're going to do. Um, there, there's, um, and it's, it's a weird, a weird thing, um, that, that there are, that we very rarely, before we talk about creative briefs, we very rarely talk about how does the advertising, how in general, how does it work? How does it work in the context of our business? How do we want it to work in the context of our business? Um, and like having that conversation up front is far more important than, than, a, a, than a lot of other things. One of the things you get to a lot is that the primary job of our advertising is to be entertaining. Um, we've, and, had Paul, we've had Paul Feldwick on the show. Yeah. And, and okay, he, yeah. He's yeah, influenced. And Bob, Hoff, Bob Hoffman, if you know who he is, he's a big, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's a f former ad agency guy who's now retired and and, and talks I, I, and bloviates depending upon your point of view. I agree with you completely that, you know, I, I would take it a step further. I would say that most of the advertising approvers in corporations do have an idea of, of they might not want to articulate it in a meeting. They do have an idea of how advertising works. It just happens to be a very primitive and probably not accurate uh, depiction, which is more of that early salesmanship model of I got to make you it's a very linear I make you aware I tell you what our proposition is you consider it and then you buy it and it's all very rational and linear and to your point a lot of it is a lot more random than that a lot of it is you know how do I that's why and and I was going to ask you about this you know the things that Byron Sharp talks about seem very academic but they really I think describe the way people think and buy in most cases, right? You know, most of the things we buy, most of the decisions we make, we make using heuristics. We don't think about them very much. And so, you know, burring your way into people's heads, you know, by entertaining them, by telling a joke, by bombarding them with a ton of messaging, there's different ways of doing it, but mental availability is, in the end is like, how can I buy you if I don't even know you exist? And how am I, what's the best way for me to make you know I exist and not get confused that it's a competitor speaking because all the competitors in that industry speak the same. Usually anything you do accrues to the, to the industry leader because everybody's talking the same. So, you know, when Burger King advertises breakfast, McDonald's breakfast sales go up, right? So, yeah. Um, but, it, but I, I mean, again, I, I think one of the things, one of the joys for me, I remember working advertising is uh, like you meet a new client and you think they do X and then you, within five minutes of meeting them, you realize, oh, actually what you do is Y. Like um, car companies are just finance businesses. That, that's all they do. Or uh, Coke is just, a, just manages relationships with bottlers. You know, it's it's just like the the they, they don't do the thing you think they that the, the, that they do, and their expertise is always somewhere else. Like Nike's expertise is is um, sports marketing, like relationships with athletes. That's really what they do. That um, and uh, similarly, like all the generalized rules about how to do this stuff, I I I think collapse on encounter with any specific case you know what I mean it's like it, it that you can get good habits as you say you learn some pattern recognition um, what what actually 
I, I think you learn is how organizations work, not how creativity works, not how to do brands or, or how to do advertising for this brand or this brand or this brand. What you tend to learn is people and organizations. So I, I think the goods, I think a, a strategist career for the most part is um, like you start off by, it, for an effective strategist, your job is, I think you, you said something earlier on about like, is not to be clever and it's not to be right. It's to get something done. Um, because for the most part, the most part, like organizations just don't do anything and they certainly don't do anything different. Um, so they, they either do nothing or they continue doing the thing they've done before. Um, so getting an organization to do something different is like the hardest challenge in the world. And so I'm that's a good, that's go a on, good sorry. segue into the question I wanted to ask you. So now yeah, as, yeah. A, as a CMO in one of these organizations, what's it like? Is it frustrating? Have you been able to be a change agent? Because I, I got to believe that Bulb is the same in a lot of ways as any other organization, right? There's a kind of the biases are similar. Um, you know, they're either doing nothing or they're doing more of the same that they've always done or that other people have done. So how do you, how does someone like you, who obviously has some very different thinking, um, how have you found it? Well, Bulb is, is now in very difficult, uh, different circumstances because of the energy crisis that's happened around the world. So we're not exactly typical. Um, and um, we're not doing anything in this area at the moment. But when we were, um, what did I learn? Uh, the first thing is, um, as a CMO, never done it before and had a background in advertising, I spent... I don't know, two percent of my time thinking about advertising, um, and we had a very clear. We uh, are because of I guess because of my background, um, we went and fight, we went and hired, we went and worked with three really good agencies for a, for pitching for a pitch. We gave them a very straightforward brief and not much time. Um, and we hired the comp the people that we got on with the best. They didn't do the best work, but they seemed like we'd enjoy working with them the most. Um, and then they did great work. And we sort of assumed that it would take five or six years before they would do something brilliant. Um, but that we would, that it was worth the wait to allow Great, allow work to happen in those those years, which was my experience with Honda. We did we did brilliant work on Honda, but it took two or three campaigns to get there, of, and of the client just trusting us, going, I'm sure the next one will be the one. Well, um, Russell, that's that's a good point. I'd like to ask you about that. Did you have to do any persuading internally to let your agency have that amount of time to do what you thought could ultimately be brilliant work? Um, no, partly because no one else knew anything about what was going on. We were we were a very small startup at the time, um, and I had a CEO who who trusted the the same process. Um, ultimately, we didn't get that time um, because circumstances changed. We still did some we did some pretty good work. We didn't do brilliant work, but we did strong work, and the work we were about to do uh, was was going to be brilliant. Um, but there were also definitely, um, I learned a lot about the, the forces that militate against doing that work. A lot of which are just folk understandings of how advertising works. So just that generally in an organization or in a, I mean, I'm sure you both have the same same thing. If you work in advertising or branding or, or, or wherever, everyone else thinks they can do it too. Um, they, they will grant you no professional expertise. 30 years of experience is not like, you wouldn't go to the CFO and go, well, I've seen a spreadsheet before. Why are you doing it like this? You should be doing it like that, you know. Um, but people happily do that with, with brands and advertising because they have a vague sense of how it works. And they also, it, it, I, I've talked about this too in some of the 
talks I've given, they also uh, undervalue, they undervalue the expertise, as you say, but I think part of the reason they do that is because th they're in touch with, you know, advertising is part of the pop culture and everyone's entitled to have an opinion on pop culture. And, you know, anybody that, that the mid-level advertising manager at any company um, has access to a Mac and iMovie and thinks, I know, I know how to do that. I've, I've taken a photograph before. Now, now everybody walks around, you know, there was a time when serious photography was engaged in by people that invested a lot of time, money, and resources to become very, now everybody thinks they're a photographer because they have a camera in their pocket 24 seven. Everybody thinks that they, they're a creator because they have a laptop with a, with a camera on top and they can edit on on a mac like like i do with these episodes um which i but i'm humble enough to understand that what i do editing these episodes is nothing like what a real craftsman does what a real professional does and what you know an artist does but i i think you're 100 percent right that the advertising business is um one that doesn't get a lot of uh credit um you know i i often talk about um you know when we talk about in-house versus out, out of out of house advertising agencies i say listen every corporation every big corporation has a legal department but when they're embroiled in litigation they always go out of house to get a litigator why because it's a very different you need somebody with that experience that understands what litigation is as opposed to negotiating a contract, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that that's undervalued as well in, in advertising is the reason you hire an ad agency is for outside perspective. Once you bring the agency in house over time, you're going to lose that outside perspective because everybody's just eating and breathing their own shit in, in the, in the organization. Yeah, that's true. But the, there's, there is also, so again, when we hired agencies, it was just to do TV. We did everything else um, because that's a place where there is still just genuinely different um, skills. Uh, I, I, I remember Dan Wyden saying to me once, like we were talking about like the perennial agency conversation about how you position your agency. And he said, what it boils down to is there's like 50 people in the world who can do great TV and we've got 30 of them. Um, and the, the, you know, the, the, that's what we were buying. And again, back to our previous conversation, I think the difference now is those, those people, those people on their phones going around taking stuff enough of that when advertising is, is as banal as it mostly is at the moment, it, it's actually reasonably easy to compete with it on your phone. It's only when when advertising does something absolutely extraordinary that it's worth it. Otherwise, you know what? Just get the twenty three year old to do it on their phone because it's there's a chance it will be extraordinary because they don't know what they're doing. They're like naive and and enthusiastic and engaged versus getting like an a, an OK agency to do an OK piece of work. You're like you might as well get the in house twenty three year old to do something. So the, the, there's a balance now that there are more options now to create work. And, and I think a, a contemporary CMO has more, ha, has to make more decisions about where the best place to get the best stuff from um, is going to be and how to make those mixes happen. Yeah, we mentioned earlier, Russell, that we had Bob Hoffman as a guest. We also had Paul Feldwick and of the multitude of guests that we've had now, including you, the number of, of contrarians is, is, um, and I would say in a minority, you know, I, I loved reading Paul Feldwick's books because he reminded us that we don't know even our own history. Advertising professionals don't even know their, our own history. And I think he and Bob Hoffman would share the view that Bob has advocated in the multiple posts on LinkedIn and on his own blog post, where he says that every creative brief for every brand should be three words, make us famous. Now we have a slight difference of opinion on that, but I, you know, it's, it's an argument that you can make. And I think 
if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying essentially the same thing. So you clearly have evolved and you're thinking about a brief um, over the years. Yeah, Am I'd I say, I, 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 yeah, I think that's probably true. Uh, I, th I, I think there's a couple of things that have happened. The first is, and this, this is a bit that I, I don't want to downplay as a factor, but it's, it sounds um, second, of secondary importance. But, but the brief as an organizational tool is important as, as a tool for getting the organization aligned about what we're going to do for setting expectations for what I've mostly been talking about is, is the brief as a thing that creates creative work. Um, okay. And I think that's, I, we can talk about that. That's a different conversation to the brief as an organizational object um but which you know the the C, the ceo will probably read and they have to go yeah broadly that i'm happy with that like there's a lot of stuff about just getting work done irrespective of what it's like that, that the brief contributes to and is an art and is important and a lot of it a lot of planners are very good at it's that kind of consensus building with words it's like you've got to find the three words that roughly mean what you want to say that everyone agrees with that that you know also creates room for work that's a bit unexpected that like there's a lot there's a big there's a craft to that and and some people are better than others and you can learn it and it's important um and that very often just creates room for creative work to happen like organizationally it allows the space in which good interesting thinking can happen and then there's something else, which is like, what's the stimulus for creating that creative work? And what are the boundaries that you put around it? Like, how, how do you make it? And, and very often, I think one of the problems, one of the difficulties in writing a creative brief is like, we make all of those things the same thing. Uh, and they don't, they don't always have to be. I think the other thing that I've definitely realized over, over time is because I'm a, I'm a words person, um, I tend to think the words are like 90, 90% of the, of what's important. And they're about 5% of what's important. Um, and again, but I mean, sure. Paul would, would, would back this, back this up. But again, I, I definitely learned this from Nike. Um, Nike are effect. I always, I always describe them as post literate. Um, like they can read, but they don't, um, they, they, you know, everything it's visual, it's a visual culture. And one of the reasons that they're effective is that they think in video. They think in images and motion and texture and tone and vibe and feel and... Um, like Apple, Apple does the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, they're good at words. They'll do words if necessary, or they'll hire some writers. But they're, the, one of the things I worked, I worked on a brief for a World Cup and the brief was a picture. The brief was a, a, a picture of, of an anonymous footballer running very fast. It was a gorgeous picture. And, and they were like, OK, for this World Cup, that's the brief. Um, and everyone knew what that was, but no one could put it into words. But that didn't matter. Um, and we, we make we, briefs, make advertising about words because words are we can argue about them. Everyone can spend a long time arguing about them. We can measure whether they whether we drove them into people's heads or not. Um, we can play them back. Everyone gets it. But they are. They're very often just the the best advertising, the words. And actually, I'd very often argue the proposition is just an excuse for you to do everything else um, for you to do. Well, that's and tone and drama and all that other stuff. That's what I've yeah. said. You know, we we did a uh, an episode about is the single minded proposition and a brief even necessary? And and I said it's necessary in the sense that it's a MacGuffin in a movie. You, you need something to kind of organize the action around, but don't pay too much attention to the actual words on there. Um, it's just there as a placeholder. It could be the Maltese Falcon. It could be the Ark of the Covenant. It doesn't matter what it is that we're all chasing. Um, 
but there's this story that's going to happen and it's going to, but you said something interesting, which was that I think it was re related to Nike or to widen that they think in terms of video. And I think sadly that truth that makes them what they are and makes them one of the elite agencies, as we mentioned earlier is blasphemy in 99% of marketing corridors, like where they say digital first and TV is yesterday. And, and the truth is creating an incredible vi visual um, experience has been proven to be something super powerful. Like we see it long form in the movies, like movies can make you cry. They can make you laugh. They can make you think they can make, they can make you lose sleep. Um, and I don't see any shame in recognizing that and saying, you know, guys, yeah, let's come up with a killer TV spot because from that TV spot, we can, and I was wondering this when you said you hired these agencies only to do your TV, is that from that, then we can take something and put it into other media because through that discovery process of what's going to work in a short film, we're, it's an organic process and we're going to come up with something interesting and, and creative and, and engaging. Yeah, I mean, I would say, again, I was talking about like Nike at the beginning of the 2000s um, as a company that thought in video. I, I, I think probably now they're a company that thinks in moving images on small screens. Um, and... Uh, uh, I would imagine because the culture will have sustained and and transformed in that way. Um, but the uh, there's um we made a we made a Honda ad called Cog, um, which was about all these which had all these moving parts. It was like a chain reaction of of moving parts, like a. Um, mm. Oh, we call them Heath Robinson machine in the UK. You call them something else. Rube Goldberg machine. Rube Goldberg machine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we made this it was a lovely, great ad. Um, really nice ad. Isn't it nice when things just work? Um, it was, it was um, what no one ignored. And, and there, well, I wrote a case study about, like wrote an awards paper about it, blah, blah, blah. Po post rationalized the hell out of it to make it seem like we knew what we were doing. Um, we, we originally presented that script for a completely different car um, on a completely different brief. And it, the client didn't buy it for that brief. 
a year later, we were presenting work on this other thing, um, on another car. We weren't getting anywhere, like script after script after script. They didn't, they didn't buy it. Eventually, the client took me out for coffee and said, you know what, if you, you know that script you had like a year ago for that, that other thing? You present that, we'd probably buy it. Uh, and I was like, okay, yeah, good. And, you know, we presented the other script. And I mean, that nine times out of 10, that's the job of the planner. But the, um, and it, it, it was remarkable. It was really good and it worked. And I've spent my life, uh, less so nowadays, because no one remembers it, but I spent, I spent my life for a long time, people going, well, that ad was about X. Like the, the, the proposition for that ad was this, like the meaning for that ad was this. And I'm like, it was not, it, it wasn't, there wasn't one. It, you know, it was just, and, and again. And Paul, Paul Felbeck has made that same argument. He uses in, in his book, um, uh, something about humbug. It's like right here and I can't think of the title, but yeah. he argues that the spot for Volvo, the Volvo truck with um, Claude Van Damme Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Has no proposition. Yeah. Has no proposition. Because it's two trucks going backwards at a bazillion miles per hour and they pull apart and Van Damme does the split. It's just about entertainment. It's just about, oh, this is an amazing feature. It's like, what is the single minor proposition? Well, there really isn't one. Yeah. Well, there's a demo. You, it's you, it's you, a demo for yeah, yeah, you can't you can't turn away. I, I wanna I wanna just as a fellow wordsmith, Russell, you know, you said you're the perfect brief for the for the World Cup was a fantastic photograph of a footballer. And I see that, yeah, that's great. Um, years ago, I took, I took a, a, some work, a workshop with Stavros Cosmopolis, wow. Bill Holiday Cosmopolis. Yeah, this, yeah. Was a little, this was a little booklet. He had, he had two booklets that he gave us that he printed up himself. And this is dated from like 1991 or something. I was in Chicago at the time. And he has this argument where he says, because he was an art director. He said, um, he said, there are places, many places where pictures are as valuable, if not more so than words. I would hate to build a house or rocket ship without a diagram. Some ideas have unique connotations to individuals where a single picture will do the same job as a word or vice versa. However, if you wanted to convey that very same idea to millions of people, it would take millions of pictures when one or two words will give the readers enough information to stimulate their imaginations to form for each a personal and perfect picture of what you are saying. The words on the next page are an example. Can you see what it says? No. It says your mother. Ah. So the footballer image is perfect because, you know, any generic picture of a footballer will convey World Cup. But if you tried to show a photograph that encompass that captures the image in your head of, a, of your mother, it wouldn't work. But if you just say your mother, you have an instant picture. So I, I, I clearly understand what you're saying that the power of visuals and, and as a former creative, I used to, I used to struggle all the time to solve the creative brief with a visual solution rather than all mm -hmm. type. All type is easy, right? The Economist campaign has won rewards for their all type ads. They're brilliant. But if you can come up with an image, so as a writer, I get it, but sometimes words really are, are the only thing. You know, John Haggerty, you know, wrote in his book, he said, when I look at that single minded proposition, my job is to take that proposition, write it down on a piece of paper, above or below a picture of the product, stick that on my wall. And if I can, he said, if that's a good ad, Okay, my job then is to make it better. Yeah, yeah. Do you... yeah. And and the way and typically the way Haggerty would do it would was with a gorgeous bit of film with no words in it. <laughs> um, uh, but the but and I think I mean you're absolutely right. And again, this is why generalizing is so unhelpful because, like, you can solve some problems with words and some problems with with images, and often the same problem in both ways, and you just get different answers and blah blah blah. But the, the problem with words is that um, is the organizational culture that, that, that surrounds them and, and, and that enables them and the methodologies that they enable. So um, 
the problem with creative briefs often is is the bit before it and the bit after which is that okay we're going to we're going to, I, I once spent six months arguing with coke in atlanta about whether the fifth brand value for diet coke should be fun or funny um and um it just didn't it, and i just kept going it doesn't matter it doesn't matter but like we could both we could all um sit here is... and argue for months about whether it's actually it's fun or it's funny like and i do this with planners all the time i'm like you could all write 10 10 hour presentations about whether it should be fun or funny because we're That's... like skilled with words and you know we can do that but it doesn't matter that's a brilliant anecdote that brings to life why if I have my preference, if I can get away with it, I never show my creative brief to a client mm -hmm. um, because I don't want to get into parsing words and, you know, arguing about the brief when we need to be doing the work. Um, and to your point, the brief is kind of a starting point. It's a job order. It's all these things. And instead of you know, giving our creatives some fertile area to, to ideate around, um, having arguments about whether the work should be fun or fun. And I don't want to do that. But it but it's but it's part of a a set of organizational uh, frameworks which which uh, surround the work, whether you share the brief or not. So as part of that brief, someone will also be organizing a tracking study and they're going to track the work against five dimensions and one of them is going to be fun and one of them is going to be funny and and if you do work that's fun but not funny you're going to only score a 3.2 rather than a 4.8 and that's like so like surrendering to that um enables all sorts of other things to happen um and and that's that's why I, where I can, I push back against words as a way of framing creative work because it, they are useful and they're useful as components in creative work. But but if you, it's Russell, like, go on. Sorry. So do you do you um ask to see the creative briefs of the agency who do who do the work for you when you give them a project? We need to do X, Y, or Z. Do you do they share their brief with you? Do you actually, want to see we their we wrote the creative brief actually. Okay. So your agency doesn't write a brief for itself. Um, well, they might have done. I mean, I, I also know the planner who, really well who, who worked on it. So knowing Stu, he probably he probably well, yeah. Russell's written this meaningful, meaningless drivel. Um, here's the actual <laughs> brief. So um, so I, I would I would quibble. I probably with your experience, the kind of brief that you would give an agency is very different than what the typical mid level marketing director would give an agency and we've we see a huge disconnect between a brief that a client writes and a brief that a decent agency strategist would write um and this is one of the things howard and i talk about all the time which is why you know whatever they they give me i set that as like the outer parameter of of what the assignment is but i'm i'm looking for something better deeper more precise than what the client gave us, um, which is usually eight pages of horseshit and acronyms and jargon. And uh, so um, I, I think a lot of that happens. You know, there are briefs written that are never seen by anyone, but except for the creatives for whom they're intended. Um, it's also, I, I, would, I would add again, having spent a long time in, so after doing advertising and, and doing the government work, I spent a lot of time with um software developers who had a real uh, who were real evangelists very early evangelists for sort of agile development methodologies and and really understood it and one of the things you realize is that they were much more thoughtful about how work gets done than than advertising people were for instance at the time and a lot of their methodologies i thought were actually this is a much more effective way of doing any creative work than than we than than had become embedded in advertising so the way even that we're discussing how advertising is made is it's it's effective it's effective at producing a particular kind of thing i think um and and it's it's a bit like um 
if you want a particular kind of artisan bread, then, you know, then this is the model that you follow. But there are other ways, there are both other ways to make bread and there are other ways to make food. Um, and uh, again, I think because of, of how dominant advertising once was in the creative industries, a lot of that thinking about how you make a creative thing has seeped into other worlds and is not, and is not that effective. So what I learned from uh, software and design worlds was the value of like prototyping early uh, and a lot of how we worked with Honda actually was 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 a very rough quick brief and then lots of prototype work really quickly so rather than like going away for a period of weeks and writing and coming back with like the script um, it was much more like okay that's interesting Tonally, we've got all this stuff, and here's a thought, and here's a thought, and here's a thought, and 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 trust trusting them. Again, I think one of the problems with a lot of advertising cultures is the distrust of the client, and assuming that they're uh, that they don't know what they're doing, that they're going to write jargon full blah blah blah. It's like they're they're people, they're smart, um, they just don't have the vocabulary or the years of doing a particular thing in a particular way that you have, but, but they have other ways of doing things. Um, and for the most part, like they're probably in a successful business that knows how to do stuff and, and finding ways to bring them into the process rather than exclude them from it, um, again, is, is often really fertile, I'd, I'd say. Um, and again, that was the thing if I did anything right in the bulb um, anomaly relationship, and we did lots that was wrong, um, I, I, we started from the premise of we are going to trust each other, uh, and we're going to tell you everything, and you should tell us everything, and um, and we we I mean and, and we we said like this is our brief, you do what you need to do. That's a very um, rare relationship. Uh, yeah, you know. it is. It is. Well, uh, Russell, Henry and I trust that you have enjoyed this conversation. <laughs> we, I, I, Russell Davies, Chief Marketing Officer at Bulb, which is an energy startup in London. This has been a wonderful conversation. We've, you know, I appreciate the fact that we've had this chance to kind of, you know, hear a contrary view of, of the brief. I think a valuable, insightful contrary view and something that it's a reminder of what we need to think about as far as the purpose of this document and its connection to our business. So Russell, thank you so much for joining Henry and me on The Brief Brothers. It's a pleasure, thank you. That's right. Good stuff, Henry. Good stuff, Howard. He's Henry Gomez. And he's Howard Ibach, and together we're The Brief Brothers. Till next time, bye-bye. <laughs>